My name is Peter Nixon. I work for the National Trust. Um, I've worked for the National Trust for about 30 years. I've had a variety of titles. For the last 10 years, I've been Director of Conservation. But as a consequence of us looking back over the last 100 years and looking forward to the next 10, we've been trying to identify what is um, the real call to arms for a large conservation organisation with regard to a subject that um, is in need of support and under threat across the whole spectrum of conservation. And we cover everything from great classical buildings through to um, a tiny patch of land on the top of Snowdon, uh, as well as 700 miles of coastline, 50 villages, 100 million visits a year. So a big overview. And our conclusion is, with little doubt, that it is um, land and landscape which is under threat, um, ecosystem services for land and landscape itself and its beauty and it's under threat from two particular things actually three two physical things one is as we've all been talking so far the industrialization of agriculture um, and secondly a tsunami of infrastructure development uh, in the UK driven by economic policy um, never have we been so affected in the National Trust's 600 properties over three countries we have something like 27 major renewable energy developments affecting us major wind turbine farms onshore or offshore which are not necessarily a bad thing but they are affecting landscape um, we have seven nuclear power station sites or waste storage facilities that are affecting our properties. We have HS2, which is affecting 10 of our properties. We have road schemes throughout the whole country. We have pylons marching across the country. Um, so all of these things um, amount to a very significant threat if they are implemented in an unsustainable way, combined with a societal thing, which is um, the r disconnection that society now increasingly has with nature and an understanding of land. Um, so we've set ourselves uh, an emerging theme of reconnecting people with land and with nature and to operate much more on a landscape scale in terms of addressing actually the precise purposes of this conference. Um, and we recognise a landscape scale doesn't just mean UK-wide, it's global. Um, so it's quite a big task. And my title has changed from Director of Conservation to be quite specific. Um, as from Monday morning, it is now Director of Land, Landscape and Nature. <laughs> <laughs> which thrills me because um, it gives me a very focused um, way of looking at things. Uh, what we recognised, uh, and I was really interested in um, Hardy's um, chairing of the previous meeting when you introduced the organisation for which you work in Germany, you have five point something million members. That is absolutely extraordinary. So if your members could unite with our members, with the RSP members, etc., that could be a real force for something. Um, but you also said we need to recognise that land is more than just a producer of food. And of course it's a hugely important producer of food. You put up on the screen seven or eight different products of land. We've identified seven functions of land which are very, very similar. And increasingly we are believing that it's really important to understand for any piece of land its capability to produce those seven functions. And then, and this is going back to data, if you've got the evidence base you can make well-informed decisions. Of those seven, one is soils and carbon management, uh, possibly the most important. Uh, because if you don't get the basic soil right in terms of our stewardship of it, you can forget everything else that's a surface activity. And it's the one piece of common ground we found when negotiating over, for example, in the Peak District, trying to improve the quality of vegetation, of landscape, of farming, of all the outputs of land, um, with a whole variety of different stakeholders, 10,000 hectares up there that is really in deteriorating condition. The one thing that everybody understands unites us is, is managing the soil more effectively. So, um, the purpose of this session is essentially good soil stewardship, but we want to move very rapidly, particularly in the discussion, to get some traction on, first of all, what are the policy drivers that will make a difference, and then secondly, relating to that, what might the real market mechanisms be that drive the right behaviours. So, Hardy, can I ask you to introduce yourself and kick off? Thank you very much. I'm Hardy Vogtman. I was the first professor in organic agriculture, probably worldwide, then president of the state agency. That's when we were working together with Alexander Müller for region development and agriculture. My last official position was then president of the German Federal Agency for Nature Conservation. And now I'm representing the German League for Nature and Environment with, as was said, 5.6 million individual members. And 
If you talk about sustainable agriculture and sustainable soil management, the first thing what we have to consider is rethink agriculture. If you talk about sustainable agriculture, we have to rethink it entirely from what it is now. And that means actually that we have to have a better understanding of the biological processes which are happening there. Then we have to develop technologies that will support those processes and not replace them with external inputs. And if we understand them and uh, develop appropriate technologies to enhance and support those processes, then we don't need so many external inputs. And then we have the opportunity really to rely on those processes which have a benefit for all different areas we are concerned about. And this is what we always say, we cannot, we cannot alter the present agricultural system here and there and a little bit less fertilizer, a little bit less pest input. It's still the same system. And we need, it, we need it really to understand much better. And far too early, because of the success of putting some nitrogen fertilizer on it, grew better, we were, we were easily persuaded this is a way to go, without questioning that in the long term. And soil, as you said, is the number one. And to me, sustainable agriculture has really to has the underlying principle of health. Healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy human beings, and a healthy planet. That's actually what the underlying principle should be. And soil, it starts with the soil. And I have uh, just a few slides to, to put out one specific aspect. But generally, if you talk about it, usually you'd say plant production, animal production, and then it stops, and then economy. But we're talking about much more if you talk about soil. As we said in the previous session, it means clean water, clean air, biodiversity, landscape, very important. It's for us in Germany now the target to make the public aware of changes. They, they notice that much more than an individual species. They realize this. So that's what we all talk about if we talk about soil. And to have a really sustainable soil management, you have to start already with the first thing you do with the soil, that means you start plowing, drilling, fertilizing, pest control, weed control, harvesting even. You should see some of the fields when they harvest now in the fall, how they, what they look like. And then you have actually to continue and say, what is the animal husbandry? Does it not have to fit into this system? Or does it, is it something else? We have now the tendency at the moment, there is animal husbandry, feed comes from somewhere, uh, feces, they don't know where to put them actually, it's, it's too much there. They should actually put all the feces back on a tank and bring it back to Brazil, where the soybeans is coming from. That would be the proper cycle. Huh? Um, but it, the overloading, of, in, there's parts of northern Germany and Holland, I have said you can bag that soil and sell it as fertilizer. There's so much, so much in it, so much in it. So all these aspects we have to look at, and the primary one is, I think, the carbon content of the soil and the quality of that carbon. Too many people just say carbon multiplied by 1.74 is humus and that's it. That's not it. We have very different fractions. Some that move easy, others that don't. And especially nitrogen, long neglected. If we have N2O, then we have a real climate problem. So we also talk about climate if we, when we talk about soil. So this is, and this morning we never mentioned mobility. Our mobility has such an influence on soil. In Germany, we are still, every day, hmm, nearly 100 hectares. 77, 77 now per day is lost from soil in Germany. And that has a lot to do with mobility, infrastructure, housing, shopping centers with their parking lots and everything what you have there. And Politics have not ever reached, regardless what government color we had and mixed colors we had, to keep the promise of 30 hectares a day. Nobody said ever, we stop it entirely. I think 30 hectares is, shown, is bad to lose soil every day. 30 hectares is too much. It should be zero. We shouldn't lose it. And then landscape, all the roads in the landscape and interrupting it is very bad. So just, just to, to get one idea about animal husbandry, question of stocking rate. You know the story about ruminants are methane producers and they're cl climate killers. If you have the proper stocking rate, that's not a problem. If you have intenimal housing of ruminants and by feeding concentrate and make them to a monogastric animal, 
putting 80 or 20 kilos dry matter concentrate into that animal, which has a room actually for, for roughage, then you have that problem, but not if it's in a proper stocking rate. So we have to talk about all this and maybe even farms to see not one individual farm as a farm organism, but maybe a group of farms in a region as one organism working together and doing that. And we have good examples for that. So for me, just to do that quickly now is humus balance is for us a very important aspect in that production. How do we balance it? And crop rotation, again, is the key to that, and animal husbandry is a key to that. So what we do, uh, we look at the humus balance, and there's a very typical crop rotation, sugar beet, winter wheat, winter wheat. That's the most profitable one at the moment. The most stupid one from pest control, diseases, everything is, but you have chemistry. So you can do that. Biodiversity is lost, the fields look terrible, they harvest late in the year, the sugar beets, you should see the fields, comp soil compaction, runoff, terrible situation. But you see also the deficit they have in humus balance in three years in that crop rotation. They have, even if they leave the leaves of the sugar beet there, then they have a deficit between 760 to 1,400 kilograms of humus with this crop rotation. So if you continue that, you can see how your soil degrades over the time. And in contrast, if you would something from the farm, it could be farm comp composted manure, or it could be off-farm compost, which we think you include the consumers into that farm organisms. We started in 1980. That was a time when Alexander Müller and I worked very closely together. The separate collection of organic waste. Everybody said nobody's going to do it but it's not compulsory in many European states to collect itself. It's 36% of the total waste is organic. It can come back. The beauty at the moment is we have 4,600 places in Germany for composting, and now they start first methane production, anaerobically, then they loosen it, blow air through, then they make compost out of it afterwards. So that's the beauty now of having that infrastructure, energy and a humus fertilizer. So you see, Suddenly, if you use that 30 tons of dry matter in three years, that what would suggest of compost, then you suddenly have a plus of 1,000 to 1,800 tons of humus. So you can build up humus with that system. Then it's a real carbon sink. And that means the benefit of recovery of bio waste from households, from cities, or from the farm. The beauty is that we then have a humus supply. We have also a lime and nutrient supply, which is very important. You see, you get it all from there as basic fertilization, and you get also nitrogen in a not easy available form, which is very good with regard to nitrate concentration in food. It's a slow-release fertilizer, which is very beneficial for food quality, and you can also use it to replace peat in your potting soils, because we have a ridiculous situation. Germany has a, peat, a, a more protecting law but we import 900 million cubic meters of peat from Lettland, Eastland, and Russia. And we can replace it with this recovered material. So this is a very important aspect. We can have it for growing substrates. And if we have the benefits of this application of compost of any kind, then you see we have water holding capacity of the soil, increased soil temperature because it's darker, better structure, decrease of soil loss, and also very important, it is a very effective me medium against any root diseases. We have done a lot of studies. The plants are very healthy on this type of, of product. And you have also carbon sequestration, as I showed you before. 1,000 to 1,200 kilos, 800 kilos, uh, with the application of compost. And that means we can do a lot if we rethink agriculture as a system. Not a single farm, and include civil society in it by using that waste, bringing it back to the land and making use of it. So it's a cycling of nutrients there. And the soil is the key for all of this. Thank you very much.
Sorry, we'll try that again. <laughs> My name's Wendy Silver. I'm a professor of ecosystem ecology and biogeochemistry at UC Berkeley. I want to thank Patrick very much for inviting me. This is a, a different group of people for me to interact with, and I've, so far it's been just fascinating, and I'm hopefully we'll bring something to the group as well. Um, I want to talk about carbon sequestration in grasslands, and, and Professor Voltman, or uh, Dr. Voltman, had, did a wonderful introduction for what I want to talk about. I'm a climate change scientist, and I'm, I'm really interested in what drives climate change. Um, but I'm also interested in ways in which we can slow climate change. And um, let me grab this pointer, because I'm not supposed to walk close to the screen. Uh, this is a graph you're all familiar with. This is rising CO2 from, from measurements that were made, uh, started at, at the Mauna Loa volcano in, in Hawaii by, by Ralph Keeling, and that continue today. In fact, um, I plotted up to August 2013, which is the most recent data checked uh, data point that we could include. And of course, we know it's increasing, and we know why it's increasing. It's increasing primarily because of fossil fuel emissions, um, tropical deforestation and other factors, but fossil fuel emissions is by far the biggest source. There's other greenhouse gases that are driving climate change, nitrous oxide and methane emissions. Those are also growing up very, growing very rapidly. Um, and we know that agriculture is playing a role in this, right? Agriculture is an important source of all three greenhouse gases. Um, I want you to pay attention to the wiggles in the lines. We've got to do something about climate change. People talk about emissions reduction, and while emissions reduction is absolutely critical to help mitigate climate change, it's not enough. And so what I've done is I've taken the graph of increasing CO2 concentrations over time, and I've just moved it out in time, assuming that there was no increase in the rate of CO2 emissions. But we know that's not true, right? The rate of CO2 emissions is actually increasing. So the steepness of this curve is going up. So this, I'm an optimist, and this is a very optimistic, unrealistically optimistic line. And here's a very, very optimistic hypothetical emissions reduction scenario, something that right now, economically, feasibly, technically, we probably can't reach. But the point is, is that even with a very optimistic emissions reduction scenario, we're still going to see increasing greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere and increased climate change. What we really need to do is figure out ways to draw that carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's where the wiggles and the lines come in. That's where agriculture becomes part of the solution instead of part of the problem. These wiggles in the line are driven by photosynthesis and microbial respiration, photosynthesis and decomposition. Every time the wiggle goes down, it's because plants are drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis, right? We all know this. And any time the wiggle goes up, it's because microbial respiration, the decomposition of all the stuff that the plants produce, is exceeding the rate of photosynthesis. Right? So it goes up and down and up and down every year. This is primarily plants in the northern hemisphere, because that's where most of the land mass is. And every year, this happens. And more or less, the amount of decomposition equals the amount of photosynthesis. But you can see that it's not always equal. There's a little wiggle room in the wiggles. Can we play with that? Can we play with the wiggles and the lines? Can we manage ecosystems? Can we manage agricultural ecosystems to draw more carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in soil than, than uh, is is released back to the atmosphere through microbial respiration. Well, th there is good evidence that we can. Um, grasslands are a great place to look for this, and that's because grasslands live on the margins of, of, of where plants can grow because they lose more water than, that, than is coming in. They're constantly living on an annual basis, living under water deficit. And when you lin if you're a plant that's living under water deficit, you put a lot of your energy below ground into roots in search of water. And any time you get organic matter, carbon, into the ground, it, it has a higher probability of staying there. So it's going to have a larger impact on the atmosphere in the long run. So grasslands under a well-managed condition tend to be very carbon rich. That carbon can stick around for long periods of time. Of course, the way we've been managing grasslands globally for a long time has resulted in degradation and a lot of carbon release back to the atmosphere. Grasslands are a very important biome globally. They cover about 30% of the land surface globally, about 50% of the land area in the UK, 
over uh, about 50% of the land area in California where I'm from and where my research is, and about over half the, the global land use. Yeah, England's always more than that. What? <laughs> so, it's such a, I'm sorry, did I not have it on there? <laughs> Terribly sorry. <laughs> oh dear, I shouldn't have gone back. Um, just to reiterate the relative importance of soil carbon to atmospheric and plant carbon, the soil carbon pool is very large. I have it at 2,000 at, at, at petagrams, or 10 to the 15th grams of carbon globally. Now, it, that's an estimate. It's very hard. It's a black box, right? We don't know how much is in there. We can't quantify it as easily as we can pick a plant and, and determine its carbon content. But um, it's at least three times as big as the carbon pool, and it's about three times as big as the atmospheric pool, the pl plant carbon pool and the atmospheric pool. So there's a lot of potential there. Oop, what did I just do? There we go. There we go. And, and I, don't need to, I don't need to reiterate this. Um, Professor Volman talked about this quite a bit, but managing soils for carbon content for climate change mitigation has a ton of, of co-benefits. So from an economics perspective, from a true cost accounting perspective, this is something we should be doing anyway. It's going to increase fertility, water holding capacity, soil stability, which leads to greater sustainability and greater productivity. Of course, farmers and ranchers have been managing their soil organic matter content for a long time. We've just had competing needs and competing issues, and I think we've lost track of our soil carbon. So. Whoops, it's not doing anything. No, it's stuck. Well, I'll keep going. So, so, oh, there you go. Can you get that? So what we've been looking at, and I was really happy to hear you talk about compost, what we've been looking at is trying to, to take a greenhouse gas emitting source of, there it is, of organic matter that's currently a big part of the problem, waste. So food waste and agricultural waste, at least in the U.S., generally ends up in either in a, a landfill where it produces a lot of methane or in a pile, a manure pile, a food pile, an agricultural waste pile where it produces methane and nitrous oxide. These are very big sources of greenhouse gas. We take that material out of those piles, compost it, which reduces it in size, and if you use, organic, if you use a, aerobic composting, you have low, low, much lower emissions than you would if you had put it into an anaerobic landfill. And then you can apply it to the land and grow more food, grow more grass, which increases photosynthesis, draws more carbon down. Okay, so we apply it to land. We've been doing this in, in several sites in California. This is some of our data. Uh, the red bars are the composted sites, the blue bars are the controls. Um, as I said, this has been replicated. We did a one-time application in 2008, very, very thin layer. We increased net primary productivity, which ranchers would call forage production. But as a scientist, we're looking at plant growth rates. So we dramatically increase it. From a one-time application, four years out, we're still seeing an increase. We get a lot of interannual variability in California. It's very dry, and we tend to see differences in plant growth from year to year. So a lot of above-ground growth. This is an incentive for ranchers, right? Ranchers need to, to, to try to increase their forage production, especially with our changing climate. As it gets drier, we need to, to see a little bit more stability in our grass production. How much was it per We increased um, our, our uh, no, above ground. Oh, it, how much tons per hectare? Yeah. It, we, so I'm thinking of in terms of carbon. We added a thin layer, but it was about 14 metric tons of carbon per hectare. So it's, yeah, it was a lot. So, but we've done now experiments with much lower, much, that was about as thin as we could apply it. Um, so it was a very thin layer, but it was very carbon rich. So now we're looking at different compost qualities. Just to say that anything above the line in this graph is carbon that was stored in soils. We added um, from, in addition to the compost, so, 
so not counting the compost carbon that was added, the new plant carbon that was added to the system amounted to about a metric ton of carbon per hectare per year. If we take that... We put in 14 so tons. So in addition to that 14 tons, tons. So the new plant, so the carbon that was added as compost, you get a one-time carbon credit for that, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's more than just the 14 metric tons, as I'll show you, show you in this slide. But, but in addition to that, the, the ecosystem for free is generating an additional metric ton of carbon per hectare per year. Our computer simulation model, so and that's gone on now for five years. So you get an 8% return. Yeah. 8% return, which our computer model suggests that that'll, we'll be able to sustain that for about 30 years, and it doesn't break even until it's about 100 years into the, into the system. So from, a, from for adding 14 metric tons, so over the, that, that long term, we actually get a considerable return. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. We've done the full life cycle assessment of this from a carbon accounting perspective. I'd love somebody to do this from an economic perspective. But from a carbon, carbon accounting perspective, we've looked at the transportation costs, the production of the compost, um, and compared it to two other common practices, manure application, raw manure, and nitrogen fertilizer. Again, looking at it from the ecosystem perspective. And when you do that, both manure and nitrogen fertilizer, of course, are greenhouse gas sources. But when you look at compost, you actually get a big sink. You get a very big offset from taking that material out of a greenhouse gas emitting source. And so your, your, your gain now gets up to 30 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent uh, per, per hectare per year. So it's very large. Those are actual data. It's the, the published in Ecosystems earlier this year. Um, so let's scale those numbers up for fun. Um, this, this now is a theoretical analysis. Um, we'll take one metric ton of carbon per hectare per year. Okay, that was what we were able to do in our field trials. And we'll scale it over six million hectares of rangeland. Six million hectares of rangeland is a quarter of the land area in California. It's about a half of the rangeland area in the UK. Okay. In California, livestock emit 15 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. If we could sequester grassland, grassland. Yeah, okay. any, managed, any managed grassland is what we call rangeland. So, so livestock emit 15 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year for the whole state of California, the largest dairy producing state in, in the US. If we could sequester one metric ton of carbon per hectare per year in just a quarter of the land area, rangeland area, grassland area in California, we would, we would offset 21 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year, more than what the livestock are emitting. Um, the commercial and residential energy sector emit 42 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent, one metric ton of carbon per hectare per year over a quarter of the rangeland in California would offset half of the the commercial and residential ener energy, energy sector, or about half of the electric, or a qu I'm sorry, about a, a quarter of the electrical generation for the state. So in a, the point here is, is that it actually can have a significant impact on greenhouse gas accounting. So let's scale it up even more. If we look at 25% of California or 50% of the grasslands areas in, in um, the UK, this adds up to 23 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent if you don't count the compost carbon. If you include the compost carbon, it's 337 million metric tons of CO2 equivalents. Now, you get that in the first year. You don't get that in every subsequent year. But boy, that's a lot of carbon offset. If you start thinking about paying for that carbon offset, even at a relatively low rate of return, it suddenly starts to begin to not only pay for itself, but maybe give the rancher a little bit of benefit. I don't, I don't think anybody's going to get rich off of this, but it certainly is going to help feed into um, the costs of the process and probably a little bit more. Now, um, Patrick asked me to go beyond compost, and one of the things that we're looking into now is grazing. Not everywhere is going to be suitable for looking at compost additions, so we've been looking at improved grazing practices. Some of my colleagues have been working on this. We're starting to work on this. You can get a wide range of carbon sequestration rates, up to, again, about a metric ton of carbon per hectare per year. Small rates, large land area. So if we scale this up, it gives us between uh, about 0.4 to 0.9 metric tons of carbon per hectare per year, um, a, a rate 
gives 15 to 37 uh, metric t million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Again, now we're up to 12 million hectares. That's, ha that's half the, the rangeland area in California and all of the rangeland area in the UK because we figure everywhere is grazed, right? Almost all the rangelands in the world are grazed. And so we can probably apply improved grazing practices, more rotational grazing, more likely, most likely, and sequester, again, a lot of carbon through this process. So just to summarize, agriculture can be part of the solution to climate change in a significant way. Soil carbon sequestration is possible and quantifiable in rangeland soils, and I'd be happy to talk with people about that later. People have argued that you cannot detect changes in soil carbon. We've been detecting changes in soil carbon in the literature for many, many years. Um, it's quite doable. There are some really key questions and next steps. What are the best grazing practices that work and why? Uh, we really know very little about uh, patterns in grazing and what, what we can do to improve uh, grazing patterns. And finally, uh, testing in arid and semi-arid grasslands. Most of the work that's been done, surprisingly, um, has been done in, in mesic or Mediterranean systems, and very little has been done in the drier end of the spectrum. And so we need to look at these systems and figure out what's going on. And with that, I will thank my funders and my laboratory. Thank you. <laughs> Wendy, thank you very much. Uh, one of the very immediate benefit to me just of being at this conference is to know that Wendy exists and you've been doing this work because it overlaps with some applied research the Trust has been doing, the National Trust has been doing um, on our own land. We have very extensive grasslands and we have, uh, I mean, carbon management is one of the purposes for understanding that, but also we want grassland to be continue to be managed effectively for its landscape implications and also culturally to maintain um, rare breeds. So again, it comes back to the point you're making, Hardy, with regard to the different functions of land. And actually, everything is life in life is connected, if only you can understand the connections. And I suspect that's what this conference is going to reveal, a lot of those connections. So, thank you. Alexander, over to you. Thanks a lot. First of all, I would like to thank Pat Patrick for bringing together this group of people and while they are trying to find my presentation, because something seems to have happened there. And you have to look for the stick. Let go into the finder. Uh, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Alexander Müller. I'm working since three or four months in an institute with a very nice name, Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies, uh, founded by Klaus Töpfer, the former head of UNEP. And before that, I spent seven and a half years in FAO as uh, Assistant Director General heading the Department of Natural Resources. And there I could really see how difficult it is to try to discuss change when it comes to soils within the agricultural community. So I led a process over five to six years looking at voluntary guidelines for good governance on access to land. And in the end, we managed to get the agreement of our 193 member countries. And I have to... Okay, I'm going away. Is it better? Good. And we also launched the Global Soil Partnership. And what I'm going to do now in my presentation is, and I can speak and use the computer at the same time, I hope, no, it's not, it's not really. It is. <laughs> what I would like to do is to present two items in one presentation. First is some comments on the current situation of soils and why we have to act. And second, try to explain how a model for a great transition could look like. Because if we are honest, changing agriculture is a great transformation. Agriculture is full of vested interests and by the way, while transforming agriculture, we have to ensure that we produce a lot, a lot of food. And therefore, I think we have to talk about what do we need to know, how to set up a process in order to change things and how to communicate this transformation. And I would like to start with looking at the situation of land. This is a project in Germany, Economics of Land Degradation, and it's very clear, 1 to 1.5 billion people are living on degraded land, mainly the poorest of the people. By the way, when we are talking about restoration of land, we have to consider that the poorest people will not be kicked off the land in order th so that others can make all the profits when it comes to land restoration. And there's an estimate that 500 million billion US dollars, this is the amount of, uh, that the world's poor could, pay, could be paid for services such as uh, carbon sequestration. At the same time, we know that 24% of globally usable land is degraded. That's twice the time of Russia. So we know quite a lot. And the question is, why aren't we acting? 
And we also have some other very nice figures, very simple figures. So there's an estimate that we are losing every year 24 billion tons of topsoil, every year, every year, by wind and water erosion. This is 3.4 tons per person a year. In some areas, we did a project in Somalia, we are losing 100 tons per hectare and year of fertile topsoil because of unsustainable practices. People did a model estimate that this erosion costs every person at the world 70 US dollars every year. This amounts to 490 billion US dollars every year. But the very nice thing is this doesn't show up in any accounting system. It happens and happens and no one has to pay for it. And therefore, we did an estimate, now I'm still in my FEO time, which agricultural systems are at risk today. Brown means because of land scarcity. Blue means because of water scarcity. And if you look at all of these areas, you see that tensely populated areas, India, China, but also in Africa, we already today have agricultural systems at risk because of land degradation, land scarcity, and water scarcity. Now, how are we dealing currently with it? We are in the Anthropocene, the Holocene is over. So human alterations on nature have reached a new quantity and quality. We are living in the Anthropocene, Paul Grutzen introduced it. Humanity is acting as a quasi-geological force and we are changing everything. And if we are continuing with the business as usual model, we will provide a lot, a lot of damage. And therefore, the question is, what is the role of fertilizers and phosphorus in today's world? And my message is that currently we are using a huge amount of fertilizers and phosphorus in order to hide the problems and to continue with production. If you look at these figures here, the trends in fertilizer use over the last years. And don't forget, there are a lot of vested interests behind. These people are not really interested in applying your, your, your compost everywhere. It's a billion dollars industry and this is used all over the world with increased use of fertilizers in Africa to hide that we have problems with degraded land, with food production, and we can continue some more years with the business as usual approach. At the same time, we know uh, Mr. Tillman has put this together that the nitrogen application has decreasing growth rates in production. So we, are, we need more nitrogen and the growth rates are decreasing. At the same time, we are using a huge amount of phosphorus, phosphate drug in red, over the last years. This is 1950 here. It's going up and up and up. And if you look at the system, we all know that phosphorus is an essential element. It's very, it has a very low efficiency. Currently, we are using 24 megatons of phosphorus every year for fertilizers. But people on the planet only consume 3 megatons. 24, 3 only consumed. And if you look at the losses in the production, we are mining around 36 megatons. So only 10 to maybe 12% are really reaching human beings with the food. So there's a huge loss. And even if you increase efficiency by 10, 20, 30, 50 percent, there's still a huge loss. And around 10 to 12 megatons from mined phosphorus are transferred to the sea. So we have a problem in an area where we know that the resources are very finite, 50 years or 100, 150 years, doesn't really matter. Phosphorus Mining is done in some of the most instable regions of the world. Look at Morocco and Western Sahara. But the whole agricultural system is based on this inefficient use. And if you look at the phosphorus cycle and the damage is produced, you can see this is really a very clear indicator for the Anthropocene. At global scale, we are changing the nutrient cycles. Johann Rockström made this very nice picture that in the nutrient cycle we are above the, the, the planetary boundaries. But this is the basis of our food production. So if we want to change agriculture, let's not be naive. We have to talk about vested interests. We have to talk about structures. And the question is, how can we change these structures? And at the same time, very briefly, if we look at a business like usual scenario, we'll have 
the world in, here it is, 2205, 2050 and 2080, hungry people and obese people. And as a result of this system, we have currently 850 million people being hungry and 570 million being people being obese. In 2050, the forecast is still 330 million people being hungry, 1.4 billion people being obese, and in 2080, 150 million people being hungry and 2 billion people being obese. So we have on the other side of the equation, not only this fertilizer and phosphorus cycle, but we have a food system where in the end, the health system of developing countries will not be able to deal with obesity. We only have to look at the situation and the cost in the United States today. So it's very clear the current system is not sustainable. And therefore the question is, how can we change the system? And I would like to bring in th three minutes an example of what we call the energy energy wende in Germany, the big transition from coal-fired power plants, nuclear power to renewables. First of all, let's talk about the time horizon. The energy wende started in 86 after Chernobyl, so it takes time. And for transforming agriculture, it also will take time. Second, the process was we had a long attempt to have a bipartisan consensus in the German parliament. And in two, uh, 2001, the Red-Green Coalition, where Hardy and myself, we worked very closely together, we could also bring the big uh, companies to sign a contract that they agree to increase the production of renewable energy. At the time, in 2001, we had maybe 1.5 to 2% of renewable electricity in Germany. Now we have depending on wind and solar, we have 30 to 50 percent. And at this time when we negotiated it, these big companies said, this is impossible. You will never go above 5 or 10 percent maximum. This is the same situation, by the way, if you talk to the big agricultural companies. They will tell you, compost, forget it. It's a nice concept, but in reality, we will never be able to feed the world with it. The same situation with the big electricity companies. And now these companies have a big, big financial problem because the development of renewables was so fast and so powerful, they have to change their business model completely. And if you look at how fast we went, in 2004 we had feed-in tariffs in Germany. Per kilowatt hour we paid 60 euro cents. Until now we had a decrease and now it's maybe 17 euro cents, so a large economy of scale, which led to a situation that more and more people want to produce in renewable energies, solar and wind, this is only for solar, so that we can really have a big inclusive production of new renewable energies. And this is my question, if we are talking about transformation of agriculture, what do we have to do that people buy in? And here the secret behind is, We've made a law in 2001. Everybody who installs a photovoltaic system on his or her roof will get for the next 20 years a certain amount of money per kilowatt hour produced. So it's a good investment. A lot of people can do the investment, not only the big companies. And at the same time, the economy of scale brought the costs down. So every year it's getting cheaper and cheaper. And by the way, now it's competitive. If you take solar panels, and use it for development. They are cheaper than building new coal-fired power plants and establishing a big grid. So for me, this is a big contribution towards sustainable energy for all in Africa, for example. So we, you have to create an incentive scheme where people could support the transformation, where people could benefit from it, and where you can really create a new power structure because vested interests in the energy and in the agriculture sector, they are very, very, very high. So you have to, to develop a system where in the end, starting with the externalities, you have to create a business model. But it's not the old businesses who will benefit from it. We need new business, new business models driving the agenda. And we have now a situation in Germany that sometimes we have very negative electricity prices because we have too much solar electricity and too much wind electricity. There are days where we are producing 8 to 9 gigawatt every day and we are 
selling a lot of this energy to France with all his nuclear power plants. In summer, when they don't have water for cooling down the nuclear power plants, we are selling solar and wind energy. And of course, we also have some problems in winter. From my perspective, the energy vendor was not very well managed in, in the last years. But the main message is we have to talk about a real great transformation of the system. We know a lot about the externalities in agriculture. We knew a lot about the externalities there, but we have to develop a business model where applying compost to the soil really is a new business model. And at the same time, we are going to feed the world. Let's not be naive. If we are talking about a transformation and we will have the first food crisis, people will go back to the good old business of phosphorus and fertilizers and an end because this is very, very profitable. So if you are looking at the conditions for a successful energy vendor, I think we have to think about conditions for a successful transformation of the agricultural system. We brought together climate protection, security of supply and an end. So it means we need a comprehensive analysis of what has to be done in order to reach what we want to achieve because we know that the current system, especially when it comes to soils, is absolutely not sustainable. Thank you very much. Wendy, thank you very much, Alexander. Yeah, I just want to make a comment. Um, I just w I, that was wonderful. And I, I just want to make a comment ab about that transformation that is happening in California in a, in a much unexpected way. And that was that when we started this, oh, sorry. When we, when we started this project, um, just the beginnings of thinking whether or not we could look for potential carbon sequestration or greenhouse gas mitigation while growing more food in California, I was invited to go talk to one of the regulatory agencies in, in um, California, the California Air Resources Board. And when I gave that talk, there were several people there from the Waste Management Board. And at the time, I couldn't figure out what they were doing there. So I <laughs> quietly walked up to somebody during the break and I said, I'm sorry, you, you know, I'm, maybe I don't understand, but what, what do you, why are you interested in what we're doing? And he said, well, we have a problem. Uh, there's, there's so much waste that's produced in our area, we have nowhere to put it. And so the state is actually looking for ways to deal with waste management in a productive manner. And so it's not happening through the big agricultural business conversion, similar to the energy changes that you're seeing. It's, it's the cities, the counties, and the state are looking at waste management and agriculture, and, and, and the changes are happening from that direction. So that may help be you know, one way that we could see this kind of transformation or the paradigm shift that we really need, I agree with you, to make these things uh, viable. Wendy, thank you. Three great presentations. Uh, it struck me the common theme between them was an absolute recognition we have to um, achieve a fundamental change in the form of production. Uh, we know what the problems are. We've got some good ideas with regard to what the solutions are. The challenge is finding the agent for that to change. Um, so that's what I'd really like us to focus on. What are the practical agents for change in terms of the right policies, um, the right development of markets, and other agents? How can you get somebody to act in a way that joins up supply and demand? And I'm just going to ask, actually, Guy, um, who has some experience in this area, if you've got any thoughts relating to that? Guy Duke, the, the Environment Bank. Um, and we had a, a short chat uh, over coffee. Uh, we work, I mean, I'll be speaking tomorrow, but we work in the area of, of offsets. Um, and um, I mean, the, the area we focus on currently is, is to do with biodiversity offsetting, um, which is fairly new in Europe. Um, Germany works quite a lot in, in this area for many years, but in most of Europe, it's fairly new. Um, England is currently considering bringing in possible legislation for biodiversity offsetting. Um, but the principle is that you have a, a developer who impacts on biodiversity, and if there's a residual impact that the developer cannot deal with, he can't avoid, he can't minimize, if there is a residual impact, then you offset that impact elsewhere. You uplift nature elsewhere, um, and uh, you don't have a net loss of nature. Um, and this can apply uh, to, to many ecosystem services, so you could equally apply that to, to soil carbon, for example, if you've got... Um, uh, Soil sealing, you mentioned a lot of loss of soil in Germany. If you're losing uh, soil carbon in one place, you could offset that through, uh, through market mechanisms uh, elsewhere. So uh, I think that's, uh, 
a point I, I can elaborate more on this uh, tomorrow uh, as one market-based uh, approach to, to, to dealing with, with some of these problems. Is Nico also mitigating, mitigating banking in, in Israel? It's very similar, yes. In fact, I'm, I'm currently doing some work for, for DEFRA, in fact, looking at your US systems and on the Australian systems for mitigation um, and, and offsetting biodiversity. Um, England, England's very interested in where the lessons that you've learned and, and how you've how you've been dealing with that. Howdy. Yes, you have asked who is the agent? It's us. It's nobody else, it's us. It's not the industry, it's nobody. We have to have and we are working on transformation of society. We think if we don't get that done, we won't get all the other transformations done. And that is very important that you really get all people together. And we are lucky enough that we have had a big conference last year with all unions, the churches, and the environmental and natural conservation NGOs. And this is a very strong power. Unfortunately, we couldn't agree to a common communique at the end. So the unions published one, what they understand by transformation, the churches published one, and we, and now we're trying to get that together again. But it's us to do it. And it's not politics. They only react, and we have to get things moving. And that's very important. And all those figures are very good, very handy, very important. For example, uh, the compost, we did the calculation, 12, 12 euros is per ton the nutrients, 18 euros is the carbon. And if you get on top of that the carbon tax, then we end up with about 50 euros per ton. That's quite a good value. And that will help if you reduce the cost for waste management that way. If you can reduce that, then all citizens have something. When you say suddenly, okay, if you do this, it costs you 30 euros less per year. Then you get people really joining you. That's very important. Just telling them it's a good thing to do is not going to work. And that's why I think it's us, we have to. And all the organizations here present, we should really think about a common action. Somehow, somehow we have to get it together. Thank you, Howdy. Uh, University New Zealand. Um, fascinating three presentations and I think it comes back to something that I'm dealing with in New Zealand is how do you get a culture change? We have these win-win things out there that seem no-brainers to us and yet I deal a lot with let's say the boards of our big companies that are people brought up in an area, era where they take orders, they don't think differently and so it's a real battle to get that culture change and you get some runs on the board. The other thing is looking at the systems they operate within. And one of the things we've found with OECD work and innovation is getting a system-wide change. So, for example, it looks like a win-win with the green growth and some of the green growth technologies. But unless you change the education of the apprentices, the wider system around it, you often don't get that kind of, you know, you don't get the win-win actually happening. But I think it's really, to me, this culture change. How do we change the culture of the agricultural sector or whoever we're dealing with? I, I just want to uh, ask Alexander, everyone really, uh, in relation to the point he made about uh, learning the lessons from the feed-in tariffs energy transformation uh, in Germany. And uh, by the way, uh, Alexander, I think it's fair to say that he was right. I he designed the feed-in tariff scheme, which led to the transformation. So uh, just to make that point, it seems to me that doing that for agriculture, specifically in relation to soil carbon, uh, is a huge idea. And could, could we not have a soil carbon stewardship scheme? Um, my question is, how could we raise the money to pay farmers to be soil carbon stewards? Where could it come from? Because a number of ideas for where that money might, become, might come from have already emerged in this discussion. This is exactly the key word, the, the European Union just missed a real opportunity. They reformed the cap, it's 50 to 60 billion every year, and it could really be used to start transforming European agriculture as a model. 
And there, there's one issue where I can really, it, it's crazy. The European Commission decided not to implement the European Soil Protection Directive. Why? Yeah. Yes, Germany and France and, and now Barroso decided if we will not have uh, uh, an agreement with the member countries, we will withdraw it. So it's, it's that. So it's the Commission, it's the member countries, it's everybody. But why? Because if the European Soil Protection Directive would have been implemented, it would have meant that farmers would have to change their practices. And if they don't do it, the subsidies would have been reduced. So it was a very strong push from the lobby, especially in Germany and in France, with support of UK, great coalition, in order not to implement it. So we have a missed opportunity. The reason why we have these special feed-in tariffs in Germany was because we also didn't get the money for really scaling up renewable energy. So we said we have two pillars. One is every producer of solar electricity will get fixed feed-in tariffs over 20 years, and every consumer using electricity, independent where he or she pays the electricity, has to pay a special fee. So consumers are paying for the energy vendor and producers are getting the money. So for the first time, we tried not to have subsidies in the electricity system. However, Patrick, this has created a big, big problem because all the other energy systems getting a lot of subsidies. Coal, for example, there are the so-called e uh, eternal costs for mining, paid by taxes. Nuclear power, if you look at what's happening in the UK, it's a very special situation. And, and therefore, we are currently working in my institute on a scheme to at least reduce a huge amount of money from the current electricity scheme, because we have 25 billion every year euros being transferred from the consumers to the producers. And we have to find a way to lower the cost for the energy vendor. Otherwise, from a perspective of, competi of competition, we will not win it. So we, we are now at maybe 30%, maybe we'll go up to 50%, but I think we should achieve 80 or 100% with some backup uh, uh, power plants. And therefore, we have to carefully consider if it's not necessary to have a tax-based subsidy system behind in order to do the next steps ahead. So subsidies is, is a difficult issue. When it comes to agriculture, the missed opportunity was the cap reform. And that's precisely um, that political dimension is what's um, driving um, the energy policy in the UK with regard to a concern that if the consumer pays, it's seen as regressive. Yep. Sorry, the gentleman in the jacket, the brown jacket there. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, Aniol Esteban from the New Economics Foundation. Um, there are several intervention points that could help start this transition. You've mentioned a few of them. I wanted to go back to one that was mentioned in the earlier session, which was to organize a bit the small-scale um, producers, where, where is the area where you, you see more of the diversity, the innovative solutions. There is a wealth of knowledge, there is a wealth of practice, but they don't seem to have enough of a strong voice or visibility, and that seems to be a key intervention to be made, so that there is a, a more visibility about all these solutions. And for this, group of um, farmers or small-scale um, innovators to uh, have a stronger influence in the policy processes. The second point is about the enabling conditions, and a key point here is um, investment and finance. So unless, if you have to make a transition, you need, you need an investment, you need, you need finance. You can make finance more expensive, lending money and at a high interest rate because it's seen as a risky venture and people are going to lend you the money at a high rate. That's what the markets would do. Or you could make finance much cheaper. And that seems critical to make that transition possible. Take the example of the uh, real deal in the UK, which lends money to uh, individuals to insulate their houses. Then they save money from the electricity bills, and they can pay it back. That has a huge interest rate. How many people have taken that deal? Hundreds, maybe 1,000. Take that same example in Germany where the interest rate was 1% or, or low, and how many people have taken that scheme? Hundreds of thousands, or, or I don't know what the numbers, but it's a massive difference of scale. So unless we don't look at these systemic financial issues, um, it's going to be very difficult. One final point, apart from on, on the investment, where it could come from, apart from the subsidies, we have the option to, do, uh, to print money. 
to do quantitative easing for the things we want to, um, to, to fund. We forget that we print money and give this to the banks for the banks to then lend to others and make a profit on that. We could be printing money to fund a transition towards a renew renewable energy system or a transition towards a sustainable agricultural system. These are innovative solutions that are, that are there that very few people dare to talk about or to, or to put into practice, but there is an option there. Hello, my name is Christine Chemnitz. I'm from Both Foundation, Germany. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and regarding this question, who are the change agents, and as well to, to Alexander's presentations of the German energy transition, I think one major difference to an uh, agricultural transition is that um, there was a combination of a real political will and the will of consumers in Germany for the German ener energy transition. And coming actually, I think, from like the real shock of everybody after, um, after, after um, Chernobyl, and then Germany was about to step out of the German energy transition, and then the Fukushima happened. So that was really, you know, very, very strong moment. And the problem with the agriculture often is that the problems for the for the society are so hidden, actually, you know. And and you know, it's not a win-win situation where you just say, hey, you know, let's change and everybody's good off. It's really it, that will hurt some people, you know, and and especially big business. And and so I think one really has to communicate that change is needed because there are these tremendous problems. And until today, I think most of the consumers still are absolutely not aware of these problems. So there is definitely a bunch of work to do, you know. And I think, I mean, you know, increase awareness is increasing, but still I think most of the consumers buying, you know, are about to buy cheap food. So there needs to be definitely a strong political will for a change. And we have the possibility for laws, and we use that. And I think, you know, I'm just skeptical about these market mechanisms, but I think it might be a combination. Hello, I'd like to just echo the... Uh, Peter Sago, you are, sorry. Oh, uh, Peter Sago, I'm a farmer and grower in West Wales. And... I'm a <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to give my talk or shall I give it? <laughs> um, and I'd like to sort of echo the gratitude for the three speeches. And I th but I would like to ask a question because it's quite clear a lot of the, the world's leading soil, soil scientists recognise, and particularly people like Ratan Lal and others, if you could put, in sort of simplistic terms, one tonne of organic matter back onto the soil every hectare, every year, you could have the potential, theoretically, of bringing the, the global CO2 levels back down to pre-industrial uh, pre levels, theoretically. Secondly, that the interest in soil, which for all my time in agriculture, has, by the conventional authorities, has been zero, has changing it's changing quite considerably. And so the idea of using compost that, that used to be thought of as some magical mystery sort of uh, element uh, is changing now. And some of the largest industrial companies in the world, Unilevers and people like that, are seeing their future in treating the soil in a correct way. Now you might not win them all, but you can win a lot of them. So we know it works. We know that we have waste to recycle because still 80% of all organic waste, as far as I know, and at least until last year, generated within the European community is still sent to landfill in, and incineration and therefore could be composted. Uh, we know we got the materials. We know we need for climate change and for food security to look at the land because we need, according to FAO figures, something like 750 million hectares of land, extra land, over the next uh, 15 years, and yet we've lost 750 million hectares, degraded, 
lightly degraded. And that's important because you've got the difference between, and Alexander's figure said 24%, well, that's lightly degraded land. You've also got an additional 16% of the global land surface area, which is severely degraded. Now, the difference between the two is important. The, the, the latter, you probably will never get back again, not easily, not within c current c uh, cost constraints, but the former is within five years you can recover it uh, if you apply. So, all of that is true. Now, what are the mechanisms, uh, I was asking, to make that work? It's not going to happen just for the, uh, a bunch of academics talking together and agreeing. It has to get out to the population. In my view, I think Alexander, I'm not sure if you were responsible for it, but somebody in FAO was responsible for creating the idea that in 2015 would be the year of soil. I think that's something that every organization here could actually sort of get hold of in their own way and support that mechanism in their individual ways and popularizing it because there are campaigns starting up in Germany in the last six months for Save Our Soils. They could be replicated everywhere in order to hit at the economic level, the macro policy level, the scientific level and the popular level because if we're not going to do that, where's the food going to come from? Somebody is bound to ask, and I have no idea what the answer is, but somebody here may. Uh, composting organic material clearly could be used as you describe, but equally it could be used for energy production in terms of anaerobic uh, digesters, etc. What, what is the basic equation in terms of cost-benefit as between those two uses with regard to impact on carbon emissions? Well, but you, you, you can do both, as I said. Right. We do both. You do we have a very extensive system in Germany to collect bio waste separately. It was, it was a political window that opened in 1980 because suddenly politics said you have to recycle 60%. And all the responsible piece, how are we going to do this? Glass and paper together, it's only about 27, 29%. And then we came and said, hey, there's 36% organic matter. If we get that out separately, then you get your 60%. So the politicians were on our side. They could fulfill the requirement and we could build the very first plant. We had a green-red government at that time, as an example, and it really took off. It really took off and it's now in many countries compulsory. The EU has a regulation on this and there's in Germany not allowed organic matter to be put in any landfill. Landfill should be out by, I don't know what year. And the beauty is, First, it was compost, and I said the figures we had about 50 euros per ton or something like this, which is the value of it. But now doing first biogas, you have the infrastructure is there to collect it. The places are there. They put first now an anaerobic digestion, because former times you had to make everything liquid. That technology is now, so you can do it in dry matter also, in dry material as it comes. You do biogas. Then you just loosen the material, have the same box, blow air through it, make it aerobic, and then you have a compost, which has much higher in the dry matter uh, nutrients than before, so it's a higher concentrated material. You lose some carbon, about 40% carbon is gone in form of methane, but the rest carbon is there. You lose a little bit more of a CO2 when you do the composting, but overall, you have a real benefit. You get methane, at a very good price, they clean it and deliver it to the grid. They don't produce somewhere electricity and heat because heat to get rid of heat is very, very difficult. So they, they sell it directly and then you have the compost. So this is a system I would suggest should be used everywhere because you can have it very much decentralized. You don't need big centralized areas. And you can have it there where you can use the compost easily. Like around Munich, we had developed the collection was in the city fresh material transported to the outside of the city, there was the compost site, and then the, the, the compost went straight out to the farmers. So this is actually a system which can work, and I, I think it benefits everybody. And you lower the cost of, of waste management. Thank you. Well, that's told me. <laughs> <laughs> Just Wendy and then Patrick. I, I don't want to add too much, because I think that, that I agree that you can, you can use anaerobic digestion to produce energy. Um, one of the mechanisms that we're seeing in, in our region in, in Northern California and, and in, in California and the U.S. It, in general is, is a focus on co-benefits. People aren't 
ready yet to focus necessarily on carbon or on climate change as, as the primary economic mechanism to make this transition. But they are really interested in waste management. They're really interested in pollution and runoff. Um, right now in, in, in our region and, and in the states in general, the primary way in which manure is stored is in a slurry pond, which creates incredible wastewater problems um, and has shown now to create all kinds of biological through microbial you know, pathogen uh, spread to be a real human health issue. And so now people are looking at the co-benefits of storing that material dry, and if you store it dry, you need to reduce it in size. Composting is a way to do that. You happen to get energy in the process. And so I think that one of those cultural shifts can come from really focusing on the co-benefits and using that also to help fund uh, the process. I just wanted to ask Hardy whether this, the statistics you quoted for uh, green waste compost apply to livestock manures or uh, farmyard manures as well. Is that are the losses the same? Is it the same equation that you could apply to uh, composting or biodigestion of farmyard manure in terms of outcomes? Yes, you can, but the nutrient content is different. So if you do the calculations, then on, on money-wise, you have a different uh, potassium, uh, ca um, calcium, and phosphorate. So that part will be different. The other part will be very similar. And then it's also different between green waste, exclusively green waste, or if you have uh, uh, we, we compost branches and everything. We just shred it, and then it's there as structural material. So it depends on just green Waste is different again than the farmyard manure, but the general process and the, uh, the general loss of carbon is the same. Nutrient contents are different, and they can be used for different purposes. Very important. We have a different material, which is very important. After the interventions of Hardy and Wendy, I thought, what, what is the difference? In the 1980s, the political message was you have to recycle. We had a lot of problems with landfills and an end. So you have to recycle, so we had to find a solution. In agriculture today, the political storyline is we have to do more of the same because we have to feed more people. And of course, that's true. In Africa, till the end of this century, there will be additional two billion people. In Ethiopia, today, 85 million people. In 2050, 180 million people. So additional 100 million people and the political storyline is more of the same and we have to change this storyline and if the storyline is changing we will find solutions how to do it and therefore i'm really happy that you mentioned the international year of soils fifth of december is the international day of soil so we try to do some awareness raising but i'm convinced that we have to translate it into solid political decisions putting pressure on the system to change. And then we will find the solutions. There are a lot of very good examples, but until now, they are not competitive. Well, you say it is not an international year, it's an international day. Both, both, right. to yeah, both. Right. But every year. And, and the yeah, year is... <laughs> I will just focus on the year. <laughs> um, hi, Matt Dunwell from uh, Tudor Trust and Ragman's Lane Farm. So uh, just w an observation and a plea, really. Um, uh, um, from what I see, the, the, um, there's nobody teaching young farmers this sort of stuff. I mean, the agricultural colleges don't take in this conversation at all. So there's an awful uh, lot of work to be done there to try and get the education of people who are working the land to, to um, appreciate the, the enormous responsibility they have for building soil carbon. That's, that's an observation. And a plea is, I mean, I've been talking about externalities for decades and decades, and my worry is that we walk away from this, from this conference wringing our hands, thinking, what can we do about changing people's minds? And I've got Hardy out on the streets in, in Germany sort of um, <laughs> protesting, and other people dealing with policy makers. And I'm one, I'm, I want to pose the question, what, where are we at with this? Are we, are we a forming a popular movement? Are we being strategic? We need to focus on something that we can take away from the conference that is a tangible take home. Absolutely good reminder, um, which I'll come back to in a moment. But <laughs> Thank you, I'm Lindsay Stringer, Director of the Sustainability Research Institute at the University of Leeds. I just want to flag up, just from listening to people talk this morning, um, we're taking a very Western-centric view on agriculture and production. And actually, given the number of small-scale farmers in the less developed regions of the world, they are actually a huge resource. They are undertaking, we, we 
it's it, the popular story is that there's all these you know, all these peasant farmers degrading the land, but actually they are undertaking a lot of quite good practices when we look at composting, when we look at even recycling and things like that. I just think there's a, a whole wealth of knowledge out there that we need to tap into really and, and learn from other places um, because there's a danger that we, we become kind of self-absorbed in our own little bubble of, of the Western world and that's why initiatives like the International Year of Soil can actually you know, help provide that springboard and that platform to, to bring about that dialogue a lot more at the international level by linking different practices across the world. <laughs> um, we've all agreed, um, all, all the speakers agreed, that um, we need to bring about change. We've talked about what those agents of change might be. I think there's a consensus that we need to be the principal agent of that change. We need to take responsibility. It's not somebody else's job, it's ours. What do we then do? A lot of the discussion, I suspect, is related to how do we achieve a, a means of enlightened self-interest out there so that people very broadly recognise what the issues are and then translate that into political action uh, so that we actually get policies changed and carrots and sticks. The areas that we've covered, um, we've looked at the uh, experience in Germany with the feed-in tariff and the uh, energy uh, sector and how that succeeded. And Patrick, you were quite excited at one point in terms of thinking how might that apply. Um, so we need probably to do some more work on that in terms of thinking of the, um, the uh, transferability of that model. Um, the gentleman who's just left but was saying um, that, uh, th what about small farmers? How can they have a voice? And I'd be interested, Patrick, again, in your view on um, all the work you've done over the years with the Soil Association and now the Sustainable Food Trust. Is there something more we could be doing to act as an umbrella for small farmers to give them a more effective voice? Um, and particularly not just with regard to the market, but um, giving them a voice uh, that might be more appealing than traditional landowners and others. I'm just thinking, I was looking at the pupils from Westminster School walking around there, and I was thinking, how much of this conversation would turn them on, and how do we actually translate it in a way that would really arrest them and make them want to do something different? I think that's a good challenge to us. Um, finance, uh, again, the chap in the jacket who's uh, had to leave us. Um, I thought that was a really good point. Um, look what's happened to the housing market in the UK. It's been too successful and the government's had to withdraw the funding to get um, start starting uh, mortgages going, etc. Um, if the, both the availability and the cost of finance can be directed towards the sort of practices um, that we would like to encourage, that's something we need to be thinking about that we should be perhaps campaigning for. Absolute agreement, it seems, that composting is a very practical solution. Um, we still need to do a lot of work, I think, in terms of developing the market there with regard to actually how, and I'm thinking of all my farm tenants, uh, the National Trust 1,500 farm tenants, they, for them, production linked to the current system is the means of making their livelihood. Um, they need something fundamentally different to make them change their ways. All the preaching in the world isn't going to do that. Um, and that's either regulation or it's a market mechanism, um, or probably a combination of both. So we really need to think about that. And the final question um, that was raised by Matt, what I think you were saying, what's our, you know, do we have an appetite for campaigning? Um, do we try to repeat what you've done in Germany? I can tell you the National Trust membership isn't generally up for that at the moment, um, <laughs> simply because you know, we have a resolution at our AGM um, and we have four million members and you might get 20,000 people voting on whatever it is. Um, the only things that really get people excited are anything to do with killing animals. It's fascinating on both sides of the fence. So whether it's badgers and bovine TB or hunting is when you get a massive turnout. But for, it, and it is really interesting. It is generally environmental issues, these sort of things we've been talking about, but that gets a much higher rate of interest from our membership than issues relating to historic houses. They just want to go and enjoy those. They are starting to think more about um, these bigger issues, but gosh, we've got a long way to go. We are too comfortable in this country and we need to recognise, I think, um, the extent to which we have problems facing us that were so graphically illustrated here with regard to the extent we are degrading our soils. So I think, um, I think those are the areas that um, we need to be reporting back on. Any thoughts on what I've just said in terms of what I've summarised? 
just what Wendy said, and I think a lot of people touched on it, one thing to excite the school children, I think we should add on the idea of sequestering um, with perennials. You know, the whole idea of permaculture, agroforestry, that is what the young people are talking about. That's why they come to our farm. So I would just ask that maybe you add that to your list. I'll certainly do that. <laughs> Patrick. I love Peter's idea about really making something out of the year of soil. And I just think, what is the, we have to address the question, what is the soil equivalent of the feed-in tariff for new renewable energy, which would change your farmers? Yeah. We have to design that. So, any other final thoughts? Here we are. Isa from Greenpeace. Um, I think we do have to tackle the vested interests uh, and not pretend they don't exist. I'm working in Africa now. Yara is all over the continent, pushing um, agro dealerships through um, Agra, funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and we can't ignore that. We should do full cost accounting of use of pesticides and fertilizers to make those more expensive and use Maybe, maybe tax them and then use that money to support composting. Thank you, thank you. Could I, uh, Patrick, I was just asking you a question, which was in terms of um, how do you bring small farmers together? Is, is there a role? You know, you've had a lot of experience of trying to do that, I know. Um, and it's well, I, I think it depends what you mean by small farmers. I mean, Lindsay's made the point that there are a lot of small smallholder farmers in Africa, but then there's Via Campesia. There are, there are already movements of small farmers, and it depends on how you... S I think we have to find a way of uniting us all. Yeah. You know, so I think your farmers yeah. and the RSPB farms, all these people need to come together. I think we mustn't make it small farmers versus big farms. It needs to be a, a, bigger, a bigger coming together than that. that. Sounds very sensible. Find that common ground that we can all agree on. Okay. Well, thank you all very much indeed. And in particular, thank you to our three great speakers. Fantastically well joined up.